Section fifty three of Common Sense in the Household. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Common Sense in the Household A Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marianne Harland. Section fifty three The Sick Room. The sick chamber should be the most quiet and cheerful in the house a sacred isle past which the waves of domestic toil and solicitude glide silently this is not an easy rule to obey whoever the invalid may be whether the mother father or the sweet youngling of the flock the foundations of the household seem thrown out of course while the sickness lasts you may have good servants and kind friends to aid you but the hitch in the machinery is not to be smoothed out by their efforts the irregularity does not annoy you you do not notice it if the attack be severe or dangerous all other things are swallowed up in the all-absorbing ever-present alarm you count nothing an inconvenience that can bring present relief or possible healing to the beloved one disdain for yourself rest or ease while the shadow hangs about the pillow crushed by the helpless head but when it passes when the first transport of thankfulness have subsided into an abiding sense of safety the mind swings back to the accustomed pivot and your eyes seem to be suddenly unbound you find with dismay that the children have run wild and the comfort of the whole family been neglected during your confinement to the post of most urgent duty with displeasure that the servants have as you consider taken advantage of your situation to omit this task and to slur over that in fine that nothing has been done well and so many things left altogether undone that you are worried out of your senses a phrase that too often signifies out of your temper and it is at just this juncture when you are called to fifty points of attention and labour at once and are on the verge of despair at the conglomeration worse than conglomerated arising before you fidgeting to pick up drop stitches in the web you were wont to keep so even that the invalid becomes most exacting unreasonable you name it to yourself even though it be like john himself who calls upon you every third minute for some little office of loving-kindness who wants to be amused and fed and petted and made generally comfortable as if he were a six months old baby who never remembers that you must be wearied out with watching and anxiety and that everything below stairs is going to destruction for the want of a balance wheel the better he loves you the more apt he is to fancy that nobody but you can do anything for him the more certain to crave something which no one else knows how to prepare and when you have strained muscle and patience a little further to get it ready and with prudent foresight made enough to last for several meals it is more than probable that his fickle taste will suggest something entirely different for the next time just for a change you know dear one gets so tired of eating the same thing so often he might be a little more considerate less childish you think turning away that he may not see your change of countenance when you have taken so much pains to suit him exactly it is harder yet when he refuses to do more than taste the delicacy you hoped would tempt him it is very nice i suppose my love says the poor fellow with the air of a martyr but it does not taste right somehow maybe the children can dispose of it if i had a lemon ice or some wine jelly such as my mother used to make i am sure i could relish it i always did detest sick people's diet if he is very much shaken as to nerves he will be likely to say messes i am fairly wild said a loving wife and mother and thrifty housekeeper to me one day when i called to see her she had just nursed her husband and three children through the influenza all had been down with it at once that form of demoniacal possession is generally conducted upon the wholesale principle one of her servants had left in disgust at the increased pressure of work the weather was rainy blowy raw the streets were muddy and there was no such thing as keeping steps and halls clean while the four invalids were cross as only toothache or influenza can make human beings i am fairly wild said the worthy creature with tears in her eyes i cannot snatch a minute from morning until night to put things straight and yet i am almost tired to death i was saying to myself as you came in that i wouldn't try any longer i would just sit still until the dirt was piled up to my chin and then i would get up on the table how often i have thought of her odd speech since sometimes with a smile more frequently with a sigh 
but with all my pity for the nurse and housekeeper i cannot conceal from myself that i would not forget or let you forget for a moment the truth that the sick one is the greater sufferer it is never pleasant to be laid upon the shelf the resting-place falsely so called is hard and narrow and uneven enough and when the tramp of the outer world does not jar the sore jaded frame when there is no apparent need for the sick person to be upon his feet and for aught that others can see or he can say he might as well stay where he is for a month or two but when the rack of pain having been removed the dull perceptions of the mind reawaken to sensitiveness and there comes to his ear the bugle call of duty sharp imperative when every idle moment speaks to him of a slain opportunity and the no longer strong man shakes his fetters with piteous cries against fate do not despise or be impatient with him he is feverish and inconsiderate and capricious because he is not himself you see only the poor wreck left by the demon as he tore his way out of him at the divine command gather it up lovingly in your arms and nurse it back to strength and comeliness the sick should always be the chief object of thought and care with all in the household if need be let the dirt lie chin deep everywhere else so long as it is kept out of that one room there be jealous in your care that nothing offends sight and smell there should be no smell in a sick chamber to avoid this let in the air freely and often cologne water will not dispel a foul odor while disinfectants are noisome in themselves bathe the patient as frequently and thoroughly as prudence will allow and change his clothing with the bend linen every day do not keep the medicines where he can see them nor let him ever witness the mixing of that which he is to swallow so soon as his meals are over remove every vestige of them from the room even a soiled spoon lying on a table or bureau may offend his fastidious appetite cover the stand or waiter from which he eats with a spotless napkin and serve his food in your daintiest wear my heart softens almost to cheerfulness when i recall the hours days weeks i have myself spent in the chamber of languishing and the ingenuity of tenderness that from my babyhood has striven to cheat the imprisonment of weariness and made me forget pain and uselessness the pretty surprises daily invented for my entertainment the exceeding nicety with which they were set out before me the loving words that nourished my spirit when the body was faint unto death these are events not slight incidents in the book of memory when i cease to be grateful for them or to learn from them how to minister unto others of the like consolation may my heart forget to beat my right hand lose her cunning do not ask your charge what he would like to eat to-day he will of a surety sicken with the effort at selection and say nothing but watch attentively for the slightest intimation of a desire for any particular delicacy and if you are assured that it cannot hurt him procure it if you can without letting him guess at your intention feed him lightly and often never bringing more into his sight than he may safely eat a big bowl of broth or jelly will either tempt him to imprudence or discourage him am i to be burdened with all that cries the affrighted stomach and will have none of it when he is very weak feed him with your own hand playfully as you would a child talking cheerily of something besides his food and coaxing him into taking the needed nutriment as only a wife and mother can or as nobody but john could beguile you to effort in the same direction study all pleasant and soothing arts to while away the time and keep worry of every kind away from him a trifle at which you can laugh will be a burden to the enfeebled mind and body and he has nothing to do but lie still and roll it over until it swells into a mountain when he can be removed without danger let him have his meals in another room changing the air of each when he is not in it every one who has suffered from long sickness knows the peculiar loathing attendant upon the idea that all food is tainted with the atmosphere of the chamber in which it is served and if eaten in bed tastes of the mattress and pillows the room and all in it may be clean fresh and sweet but the fancy cannot be dismissed and it is wiser to humour than to reason with most sick fancies a hired nurse is a useful often a necessary thing but while you are upon your feet and mistress of your own house delegate to no one the precious task of catering for the dear sufferer it is an art in itself i hope a practical knowledge of it will be taught in women's medical colleges when they are an established institution with us i wish it were proper to record here the name of one of the kindest and best family physicians i ever knew who had charge of my not very firm health during my girlhood he owed much 
i suppose no one ever knew really how much of his success in his practice to his tact and skill in devising palatable and suitable nourishment for his patients i well remember the childish pleasure with which i would hear him say when the violence of the attack had passed now my dear child we must begin with the kitchen physic and the glow of amused expectation with which i used to watch him as with an arch show of mystery he would beckon my mother from the room to receive his prescription the impatience with which i awaited the result of the conference and the zest with which i ate whatever he ordered if i could have persuaded him to manage this department of my work it would win for me a degree of m d with a new meaning mistress of dietetics the sick room beef tea one pound lean beef cut into small pieces put into a jar without a drop of water cover tightly and set in a pot of cold water heat gradually to a boil and continue this steadily for three or four hours until the meat is like white rags and the juice all drawn out season with salt to taste and when cold skim the patient will often prefer this ice cold to hot serve with albert biscuit or thin wafers unleavened made by a receipt given under the head of bread mutton broth one pound lean mutton or lamb cut small one quart water cold one tablespoonful rice or barley soaked in a very little warm water four tablespoonsful milk salt and pepper with a little chopped parsley boil the meat unsalted in the water keeping it closely covered until it falls to pieces strain it out skim add the soaked barley or rice simmer half an hour stirring often stir in the seasonings and the milk and simmer five minutes after it heats up well taking care it does not burn serve hot with cream crackers chicken broth is excellent made in the same manner as mutton cracking the bones well before you put in the fowl veal and sago broth two pounds knuckle of veal cracked all to pieces two quarts of cold water three tablespoonsful best pearl sago soaked in a cup of cold water one cup cream heated to boiling yolks of two eggs beaten light boil the veal and water in a covered saucepan very slowly until reduced to one quart of liquid strain skim season with salt and stir into the soaked sago having previously warmed it by setting for half an hour in a saucepan of boiling water and stirring from time to time simmer half an hour taking care it does not burn beat in the cream and eggs give one good boil up and turn out this is excellent for consumptives beef and sago broth two pounds of beef cut up small two quarts of water one cup of sago soaked soft in a little lukewarm water yolks of three eggs salt to taste stew the beef until it falls to pieces strain it out salt the liquid and stir in the sago simmer gently one hour stirring often add the beaten yolks boil up once and serve this is a strengthening and nice soup eat with dry toast arrowroot jelly plain one cup boiling water two heaping tablespoonsful of best bermuda arrowroot one teaspoonful lemon juice two teaspoonsful of white sugar wet the arrowroot in a little cold water and rub smooth then stir into the hot which should be on the fire and actually boiling at the time with the sugar already melted in it stir until clear boiling steadily all the while and add the lemon wet a cup in cold water and pour in the jelly to form eat cold with sugar and cream flavored with rose water an invaluable preparation in cases where wine is forbidden arrowroot wine jelly one cup boiling water two heaping teaspoonsful arrowroot two heaping white sugar one tablespoonful brandy or three tablespoonsful of wine an excellent corrective to weak bowels arrowroot blanc mange one cupful boiling milk two dessert spoonfuls best arrowroot rubbed smooth in cold water two teaspoonsful white sugar vanilla or other essence boil until it thickens well stirring all the while eat cold with cream flavored with rose water and sweetened to taste sago may be substituted for arrowroot in any of the foregoing receipts when you have soaked it an hour in water poured over it cold and gradually warmed by setting the cup containing it in hot water boil rather longer than you do the arrowroot sago gruel two cups water two tablespoonsful sago three teaspoonsful white sugar one glass of wine 
one tablespoonful lemon juice, nutmeg to taste, and a pinch of salt. Put the sago in the water while cold and warm by setting in a saucepan of boiling water. Stir often and let it soften and heat for one hour, then boil ten minutes, stirring all the while. Add the sugar, wine, and lemon, and pour into a bowl or mold to cool. Eat warm if preferred. The wine and nutmeg should be omitted if the patient be feverish. Indian Meal Gruel Two quarts of boiling water, one cup of Indian meal, and one tablespoonful flour wet up with cold water. Salt to taste, and if you like, sugar and nutmeg. Wet the meal and flour to a smooth paste, and stir into the water while it is actually boiling. Boil slowly one hour, stirring up well from the bottom. Season with salt to taste. Some sweeten it, but I like it better with a little pepper added to the salt. If a cathartic is desired, omit the white flour altogether. Oatmeal gruel is made in the same way. Milk and rice gruel. One quart boiling milk, two tablespoonsful heaping of ground rice wet with cold milk, one saltspoonful of salt. Stir in the rice paste and boil ten minutes, stirring all the while. Season with sugar and nutmeg and eat warm with cream. You may use Indian meal instead of rice flour, which is an astringent. In this case, boil an hour. Dried flour for teething children. One cup of flour, tied in a stout muslin bag and dropped into cold water, then set over the fire. Boil three hours steadily. Turn out the flour ball and dry it in the hot sun all day, or, if you need it at once, dry it in a moderate oven without shutting the door. To use it, grate a tablespoonful for a cupful of boiling milk and water, half and half. Wet up the flour with a very little cold water, stir in and boil five minutes. Put in a little salt. Tapioca jelly. Very good. One cup of tapioca, three cups of cold water, juice of a lemon and pinch of the grated peel, sweetened to taste. Soak the tapioca in the water four hours. Set within a saucepan of boiling water, Pour more lukewarm water over the tapioca if it has absorbed too much of the liquid, and heat, stirring frequently. If too thick after it begins to clear, put in a very little boiling water. When quite clear, put in the sugar and lemon. Pour into molds. Eat cold, with cream flavored with rose water and sweetened. Tapioca blanc mange. One cup of tapioca, soaked in two cups cold water. Three cups boiling milk. Three tablespoons full white sugar rose water or vanilla. Soak the tapioca four hours and stir, with the water in which it was soaked, into the boiling milk. Sweeten and boil slowly, stirring all the while, fifteen minutes. Take off, flavor, and put into molds. Eat cold with cream. Wash tapioca well before soaking. Arrowroot Custard. Nice. Two cups of boiling milk. Three heaping teaspoonfuls arrowroot, wet up with a little cold milk two tablespoons full white sugar beaten with egg, one egg very well beaten. Mix the arrowroot paste with the boiling milk, stir three minutes, take from the fire and whip in the egg and sugar, boil two minutes longer, flavor with vanilla or rose water, and pour into molds. Rice flour milk, two cups of milk, boiling, two tablespoons full rice flour wet up with cold milk, boil ten minutes, stirring all the while, and flavor to taste. Eat warm with cream. Sago milk. Three tablespoons full sago, soaked in a large cup, cold water, one hour. Three cups boiling milk, sweetened and flavored to taste. Simmer slowly half an hour. Eat warm. Tapioca milk is made in the same way. Boiled rice. One half cup whole rice, boiled in just enough water to cover it. One cup of milk, a little salt, one egg beaten light. When the rice is nearly done, turn off the water, add the milk and simmer, taking care it does not scorch, until the milk boils up well. Salt and beat in the egg. Eat warm with cream, sugar, and nutmeg. Panada. Six Boston crackers split. Two tablespoons full white sugar. A good pinch of salt and a little nutmeg. Enough boiling water to cover them well. Split the crackers and place in a bowl in layers. Salt and sugar scattered among them. Cover with boiling water and set on the hearth with a closed top over the bowl for at least one hour. The crackers should be almost clear and soft as jelly, but not broken. 
eat from the bowl with more sugar sprinkled in if you wish if properly made this panada is very nice bread panada or jelly pare some slices of stale baker's bread and toast nicely without burning pile in a bowl sprinkling sugar and a very little salt between cover well with boiling water and set with a tight lid upon the top in a pan of boiling water simmer gently until the contents of the bowl are like jelly eat warm with powdered sugar and nutmeg chicken jelly very nourishing half a raw chicken pounded with a mallet bones and meat together plenty of cold water to cover it well about a quart heat slowly in a covered vessel and let it simmer until the meat is in white rags and the liquid reduced one half strain and press first through a colander then through a coarse cloth salt to taste and pepper if you think best return to fire and simmer five minutes longer skim when cool give to the patient cold just from the ice with unleavened wafers keep on the ice you can make into sandwiches by putting the jelly between thin slices of bread spread lightly with butter calves feet broth two calves feet two quarts cold water one egg beaten up with two tablespoonsful milk for each cup of broth pepper and salt boil the feet to shreds strain the liquor through a double muslin bag season to taste and set by for use as you need it warm by the small quantity allowing to each cupful a beaten egg and two tablespoonsful of milk give a good boil up to cook these and serve with thin crisp toast if the patient can take it a dash of lemon juice improves the broth toast water slices of toast nicely browned without a symptom of burning enough boiling water to cover them cover closely and let them steep until cold strain the water sweeten to taste and put a piece of ice in each glassful if the physician thinks it safe add a little lemon juice apple water one large juicy pippin the most finely flavored you can get three cups of cold water one quart if the apple is very large pare and quarter the apple but do not core it put it on the fire in a tin or porcelain saucepan with the water and boil closely covered until the apple stews to pieces strain the liquor at once pressing the apple hard in the cloth strain this again through a finer bag and set away to cool sweeten with white sugar and ice for drinking it is a very refreshing and palatable drink jelly water one large tablespoonful currant or cranberry jelly one goblet ice water beat up well for a fever patient wild cherry or blackberry jelly is excellent prepared in like manner for those suffering with summer complaint flaxseed lemonade four tablespoonsful flaxseed whole one quart boiling water poured upon the flaxseed juice of two lemons leaving out the peel sweeten to taste steep three hours in a covered pitcher if too thick put in cold water with the lemon juice and sugar ice for drinking it is admirable for colds slippery elm bark tea break the bark into bits pouring boiling water over it cover and let it infuse until cold sweeten ice and take for summer disorders or add lemon juice and drink for a bad cold apple toddy boil a large juicy pippin in a quart of water and when it has broken to pieces strain off the water while it is still boiling hot add a glass of fine old whiskey a little lemon juice and sweeten to taste take hot at bedtime for influenza milk punch one tumbler of milk well sweetened two tablespoonsful best brandy well stirred in i have known very sick patients to be kept alive for days at a time with this mixture and nothing else until nature could rally her forces give very cold with ice egg and milk punch is made by the preceding receipt with an egg beaten very light with the sugar and stirred before the brandy is added iceland or irish moss lemonade a handful of irish or iceland moss washed in five waters two quarts boiling water poured upon the moss and left until cold two lemons peeled and sliced leaving out the peel sweeten very well and ice do not strain and if it thicken too much add cold water excellent for feverish colds and all pulmonary troubles iceland or irish moss jelly a handful of moss washed in five waters and soaked an hour one quart boiling water two lemons the juice only one glass of wine one quarter teaspoonful of cinnamon measure scantily 
soak the washed moss in a very little cold water stir into the boiling and simmer until it is dissolved sweeten flavor and strain into molds you may use two glasses of cider instead of one of wine for a fever patient putting in a little less water good for colds and very nourishing sea moss blanc -man. is made the same way using boiling milk instead of water and leaving out the lemons and wine flavor with vanilla or rose water dry toast pare off the crust from stale light bread slice half an inch thick and toast quickly graham bread is very nice toasted butter lightly if the patient can eat butter milk toast toast as just directed dip each slice as it comes from the toaster in boiling water butter salt slightly and lay in a deep covered dish have ready in a saucepan enough boiling milk to cover all well when your slices are packed salt this very slightly melt in it a bit of butter and pour over them closely cover and let it stand five minutes before using it it is excellent when made with graham bread this is a good dish for a family tea as well as for invalids unleavened biscuit or wafers mix good dry flour in a stiff dough with milk salt and roll out thin cut into round cakes and roll these again almost as thin as letter paper bake very quickly they may also be mixed with water these are very simple and palatable and go well with all kinds of broth especially oyster soup dried rusk see bread beefsteak and mutton chops choose the tenderest cuts and broil over a clear hot fire with your wisest skill let the steak be rare the chops well done salt and pepper layer between two hot plates three minutes and serve to your patient if he is very weak do not let him swallow anything except the juice when he has chewed the meat well the essence of rare beef roast or broiled thus expressed is considered by some physicians to be more strengthening than beef tea prepared in the usual manner sangaree or porterie one-third wine or porter mixed with two-thirds cold water sweeten great nutmeg on the top and ice serve dry toast with it taken hot it is good for a sudden cold wine whey one pint boiling milk one large glass pale wine poured in when the milk is scalding hot boil up once remove from the fire and let it cool do not stir it after the wine is put in when the curd forms draw off the whey and sweeten herb teas are made by infusing the dried or green leaves and stalks in boiling water and letting them stand until cold sweetened to taste sage tea sweetened with honey is good for a sore throat used as a gargle with a small bit of alum dissolved in it catnip tea is the best panacea for infant ills in the way of cold and colic known to nurses penny royal tea will often avert the unpleasant consequences of a sudden check of perspiration or the evils induced by ladies thin shoes chamomile and gentian teas are excellent tonics taken either cold or hot the tea made from blackberry root is said to be good for summer disorders that from green strawberry leaves is an admirable and soothing wash for a cankered mouth tea of parsley root scraped and steeped in boiling water taken warm will often cure strangury and kindred affections as will that made from dried pumpkin seed tansy and rue teas are useful in cases of colic as are fennel seeds steeped in brandy a tea of damask rose leaves dry or fresh will usually subdue any simple case of summer complaint in infants mint tea made from the green leaves crushed in cold or hot water and sweetened is palatable and healing to the stomach and bowels mint julep some sprigs of green mint slightly bruised in a tumbler with a teaspoon put in a generous teaspoonful of white sugar add gradually stirring and rubbing lightly enough water to fill the glass three-quarters of the way to the top fill up with pounded ice stir hard and pour into a larger glass that you may shake up well and put in two tablespoons full of fine brandy this is called a hailstorm julep eau sucre dissolve three or four lumps of loaf sugar in a glass of ice water and take a teaspoonful every few minutes for a tickling in the throat or a hacking cough keep it ice cold a simple but often an efficacious remedy end of section fifty three Section 54 of Common Sense in the Household. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nalini Chandran, India. Common Sense in the Household, a Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marion Horland. The Nursery. All food intended for infants should be very thoroughly cooked. The numerous varieties of farinaceous substances, biscotine, farina, rice flour, arrowroot, etc., however nourishing may be their properties when rightly prepared, are harsh and drastic when underdone. Unless you have a nurse whom you know for yourself to be faithful and experienced, always superintend the cooking of baby's food. It can do no harm. It may prevent much if you examine it every day to see that it is right as to quality and quantity. Do not aim at variety in this branch of your profession. Confine a child under three years of age to a very limited bill of fare. His stomach is too delicate an organ to be tampered with. Let milk, scalded or boiled as a rule, be the staple mixed with farina, barley or something of the sort. Let him munch graham bread and light crackers freely. Remove far from him hot bread and griddle cakes. When he has cut his carnivorous teeth, nature says, This creature wants meat. And nature's supply is seldom in advance of the demand. If he did not need what the teeth are designed to chew, you may be sure they would not be given him. Grant him the novel food sparingly and with discretion as to kind. Rare beef and well-boiled mutton, tender roast or boiled chicken and turkey are safe. Withhold fried meats of every description. Do not let him touch veal or pork in any shape. Mince the meat very finely to save his digestive apparatus all unnecessary work. Mealy old potatoes, never new or waxy, young onions boiled in two waters, fresh asparagus, green peas and dry sweet potatoes should suffice for vegetables with of course rice and hominy. For dessert, once in a while, your simple custard, a taste of homemade ice cream, rice and farina puddings, graham hasty pudding, the inner part of a well roasted apple and in their season ripe peaches and apples will not harm him taken in moderation if he be well and strong pare the fruit always the skin of an apple is as bad for him as a bit of your kid gloves would be that of a grape more indigestible than sole leather raisins skins and all are unfit for anybody to eat pulp and pits they are poisonous for baby ditto pickles pastry and preserves ditto most kinds of cake and all sorts of fruit puddings give him light suppers and put him to bed early in a dark room he will not grow better in a glare of artificial light than will your camellias and azaleas always see for yourself that his last waking thoughts are pleasant that he shuts his eyes at peace with the world and in love with you that his feet are warm his stomach easy and his body not overloaded with blankets and quilts also that the nursery is clean and freshly aired these are better prescriptions for sound slumber than all the old wife's fables of the excellent properties of that pernicious drug, soothing syrup. Farina 1 cup boiling water, 1 cup fresh milk, 1 large tablespoonful Hecker's farina, wet up with cold water, 2 teaspoonfuls white sugar, a pinch of salt. Stir the farina into the boiling water, slightly salted, in the farina kettle, that is, one boiler set within another, the latter filled with hot water. Boil 15 minutes, stirring constantly until it is well thickened. Then add the milk, stirring it in gradually and boil 15 minutes longer. Sweeten and give to the child so soon as it is cool enough. You may make enough in the morning to last all day, warming it up with a little hot milk as you want it. Keep in a cold place. Some of the finest children I have ever seen were reared upon this diet. Do not get it too sweet and cook it well. Be sure the farina is sweet and dry. Barley It sometimes happens that milk disagrees with the delicate infant so seriously that it is necessary to substitute some other article of diet for a few days. I have known barley water to be used in such cases, with great success. 2 cups boiling water, 2 tablespoonfuls pearl barley, picked over and washed, a pinch of salt, 2 teaspoonfuls white sugar not heaping. Soak the barley half an hour in a very little lukewarm water and stir without draining into the boiling water salted very slightly. Simmer one hour, stirring often and strain before sweetening. Arrowroot 
1 cup of boiling water, 1 cup fresh milk, 2 teaspoonfuls best Bermuda arrowroot wet with cold water, 1 small pinch of salt, 2 even teaspoonfuls white sugar dissolved in the milk. Stir the arrowroot paste into the salted boiling water. Stir and boil 5 minutes or until it is clear. Add the sweetened milk and boil 10 minutes slowly still stirring. If the child has fever or cannot digest milk, substitute hot water for it. It is, however, a dangerous experiment to forbid milk altogether for an infant. I should rather diminish the quantity, putting in, say, one-third or one-fourth as much as the recipe names and filling up with boiling water. Rice Jelly Half cup whole rice, well washed and soaked two hours in a little warm water. Then add it with the water to that in the kettle. 3 pints cold water. 1 small pinch of salt put into the water. Sweeten to taste with loaf sugar. Simmer the rice half an hour, then boil it until it is a smooth paste and the water is reduced one half. Strain through double tarlatan, sweeten and give to the child. This is an admirable preparation for an infant suffering with weakness of the bowels. If there is no fever, you may put one third part milk boiled with the rice. Give a few spoonfuls every hour or half hour. Milk and bread. One cup boiled milk, two tablespoonfuls stale graham bread, a very little sugar. Crumble the bread into the boiled milk, sweeten and when cool enough feed to the child with a spoon. Wheat and grits. Four tablespoonfuls grits, cracked wheat, soaked in a little cold water one hour and then put into the kettle. One quart boiling water, one cup milk, a pinch of salt. Boil the soaked grits in the quart of water one hour, stirring up often. Add the milk and boil half an hour longer. Sweeten to taste and if the child is well, pour cream over it. This is designed for children over a year old. It is slightly cathartic, especially if the milk be omitted and is most useful in regulating the bowels. When this can be done without drugs, it is far better. Homini and Milk Half cup small homini, one scant quart of cold water, pinch of salt. Boil one hour, stirring often. While hot, mix some soft with new milk, sweeten to taste and feed to baby with a spoon. This is also relaxing to the bowels and should not be given if the child is disposed to summer complaint. Graham Hasty Pudding 1 cup graham flour wet up with cold water 1 large cup boiling water and same quantity of milk 1 salt spoonful of salt Stir the wet flour into the boiling water slightly salted. Boil 15 minutes stirring almost constantly. Add the milk and cook after it has come again to a boil 10 minutes longer. Give with sugar and milk for breakfast. Eaten with cream, nutmeg and powdered sugar, this is a good plain dessert for grown people as well as children. Rice Flour Hasty Pudding Is made as above, substituting two heaping tablespoonfuls rice flour for the graham. Milk Porridge One tablespoonful Indian meal, wet to a paste with cold water. One tablespoonful white flour, wet to a paste with cold water. Two cups boiling water. 2 cups milk, a good pinch of salt. Boil the paste in the hot water 20 minutes, add the milk and cook 10 minutes stirring often. Eat with sugar and milk stirred in while hot. Mush and milk. 1 cup Indian meal wet up with cold water, 2 quarts cold water, salt to taste. Boil 2 hours, stirring often with a wooden spoon or a stick. To be eaten hot with milk and sugar. Condensed milk. This is perhaps the safest substitute for the good milk from one cow, which few mothers in town can procure. Keep the can in a cool place and mix according to directions. End of section 54 Recording by Nalini Chandran, India Section 55 of Common Sense in the Household This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Common Sense in the Household, A Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marion Harlan. Sundries Cleaning Pots, Kettles, and Tins 
boil a double handful of hay or grass in a new iron pot before attempting to cook with it scrub out with soap and sand then set on full of fair water and let it boil half an hour after this you may use it without fear as soon as you empty a pot or frying pan of that which has been cooked in it fill with hot or cold water hot is best and set back upon the fire to scald thoroughly new tins should stand near the fire with boiling water in them in which has been dissolved a spoonful of soda for an hour then be scoured inside with soft soap afterward rinsed with hot water keep them clean by rubbing with sifted wood ashes or whitening copper utensils should be cleaned with brick dust and flannel never set a vessel in the pot closet without cleaning and wiping it thoroughly if grease be left in it it will grow rancid if set aside wet it is apt to rust knives clean with a soft flannel and bath brick if rusty use wood ashes rubbed on with a newly cut bit of irish potato this will remove spots when nothing else will keep your best set wrapped in soft white paper then in linen in a drawer out of damp and dust never dip the ivory handles of knives in hot water silver wash after each meal all that is soiled in very hot soft water with hard soap wipe hard and quickly on a clean towel then polish with dry flannel if discolored with egg mustard spinach or beans by any other means rub out the stain with a stiff toothbrush used only for this purpose and silver soap for years i have used no other preparation for cleaning silver than the indexical silver soap applied as i have described after rubbing with a stiff lather made with this wash off with hot water wipe and polish while hot there is no need for the weekly silver cleaning to be an event or a bugbear if a little care and watchfulness be observed after each meal silver should never be allowed to grow dingy if bridget or chloe will not attend properly to this matter take it in hand yourself have your own soap cups two of them one with common soap the other with a cake of silver soap in the bottom have for one a mop for the other a stiff brush a toothbrush is best use your softest towels for silver besides being clean and easy of application the silver soap will not wear away the metal as will whiting or chalk or plate powder however finely pulverized china and glass there are few of the minor cooks in the lot of the careful housewife that cause her more anxiety and more discouragement than the attempt to teach domestics how to wash up dishes i've heard that mrs is very exact about some things such as washing up dishes and the likes of that said a woman to me with an affected laugh having called to apply for the then vacant position of cook in my kitchen she had high recommendations a wine engrafted upon her native brogue and spoke of me in the third person a trick of cheap and bogus gentility that tries my nerves and temper to the very marrow of my spine i was a saying to myself as i came along that mrs must have been very unlucky in her girls if she has to teach them how to wash up dishes i always thought that was one of the things that came kind of natural to every cook mrs experience goes to prove that the wrong way of doing this must come natural to the class mentioned and that nature is mighty in woman the fact that the right way is not to pile unrinsed dishes and plates in a big pan with a loose bit of soap on top and pour lukewarm water over all then with a bit of rag to splash said water over each separately and make another pile of them upon the kitchen table until the last is drawn reeking with liquid grease sticky and streaming from the now filthy puddle of diluted swill then to rub them lightly and leisurely with one towel be they many or few is as difficult of comprehension to the scullenly mind as would be a familiar lecture upon the pons asinorum yet the right and only neat method is so simple and easy rinse the greasy plates and whatever is sticky with sugar or other sweet in hot water and transfer to a larger pan a very hot wash glass first next silver then china one article at a time although you may put several in the pan 
have a mop with a handle rub upon the soap over which the water should have been poured until you have strong suds there is a little implement made by the dover stamping company a cup of tinned wire called a soap shaker that greatly facilitates this process of suds making without waste of soap wash both sides of plate and saucer and wipe before putting it out of your hand draining leaves streaks which can be felt by sensitive fingertips if not seen if china is rough to the touch it is dirty hot clean suds a dry clean towel and quick wiping leave it bright and shining roll your glasses around in the water filling them as soon as they touch it and you need never crack one a lady did once explain the dinginess of her goblets to me by saying that she was afraid to put them in hot water it rots glass and makes it so tender i prefer to have them a little cloudy this is literally true that she said it i mean certainly not that a year's soak in hot water could make glass tender washing windows dissolve a little washing soda in the water if the glass is very dim with smoke or dirt do not let it run on the sash but wash each pane with old flannel dry quickly with a soft clean towel wiping the corners with especial care polish with chamois skin or newspapers rubbed soft between the hands to clean carpets sprinkle the carpet with tea leaves sweep well then use soap and soft warm water for the grease and dirt spots this freshens up old carpets marvelously rub the wet spots dry with a clean cloth to clean paint scour with a flat brush less harsh than that used for floors using warm soft suds before it dries wash off with old flannel dipped in clean cold water and wipe dry with a linen towel or cloth go through the whole process quickly that the water may not dry upon and streak the paint to keep woolens beat out all the dust and sun for a day shake very hard fold neatly and pin or what is better sew up closely in muslin or linen cloths putting a small lump of gum camphor in the centre of each bundle wrap newspapers about all pinning so as to exclude dust and insects these are really all the precautions necessary for the safety even of furs if they are strictly obeyed but you may set moths at defiance if you can in addition to these secure as a packing case a whiskey or alcohol barrel but lately emptied and still strongly scented by the liquor have a close head and fit it in neatly set away in the garret and think no more of your treasures until next winter to wash doubtful calicoes put a teaspoonful of sugar of lead in a pailful of water and soak fifteen minutes before washing to clean a cloth coat rub soap upon the wristbands and collar dip them in boiling hot suds and scrub with a stiff clean brush treat the grease and dirt spots in the same way change the suds for clean and hot as it gets dirty wet and brush the whole coat the right way of the cloth with fresh suds when you have scoured out the spots adding three or four tablespoonfuls of alcohol to the water stretch the sleeves pocket holes wristbands and collar into shape folding the sleeves as if they have been ironed also the collar lay upon a clean cloth spread upon the table or floor and let it get perfectly dry in the shade turning over three or four times without disturbing the folds to clean silk to remove grease spots scrape venetian or french chalk fine moisten to a stiff paste with soap suds make it into flat cakes by pressing between two boards and dry in the sun or oven keep these for use when you need them scrape one to powder and cover the spot with it laying the silk upon a fine clean linen or cotton cloth lay two or three folds of tissue paper upon the chalk and press it with a hot iron for a minute or more taking care it does not touch the silk raise the paper and scrape off the grease with the chalk split a visiting card and rub the place where the spot was with the inside to restore the lustre the silk should be pressed on the wrong side if the spot be discovered at once simply rub the wrong side hard with powdered french chalk and leave it to wear off to wash silk mix together two cups cold water one tablespoonful honey 
one tablespoonful soft soap one wine glass alcohol shake up well lay the silk a breadth at a time on a table and sponge both sides with this rubbing it well in shake it about well and up and down in a tub of cold water flap it as dry as you can but do not wring it hang it by the edges not the middle until fit to iron iron on the wrong side while it is very damp black and dark or sober colored silks may be successfully treated in this way to smooth wrinkled silk sponge on the right side with very weak gum arabic water and iron on the wrong side to renew wrinkled crepe stretch over a basin of boiling water hold it smooth but not tight over the spot and shifting as the steam fairly penetrates it fold while damp in the original creases and lay under a heavy book or board to dry it will look almost as well as new to restore the pile of velvet if but slightly pressed treat as you would crepe steam on the right side until heated through if very badly crushed wet on the wrong side let an assistant hold a hot iron bottom upward and pass the wet side of the velvet slowly over the flat surface a sort of upside down ironing when the steam rises thickly through to the right side it will raise the pile with it dry without handling to curl tumbled feathers hold over the heated top of the range or stove not near enough to burn withdraw shake them out and hold them over it again until curled to clean straw matting wash with a cloth dipped in clean salt and water then wipe dry at once this prevents it from turning yellow to wash lawn or thin muslin boil two quarts of wheat bran in six quarts or more of water half an hour strain through a coarse towel and mix in the water in which the muslin is to be washed use no soap if you can help it and no starch rinse lightly in fair water this preparation both cleanses and stiffens the lawn if you can conveniently take out all the gathers the skirt should always be ripped from the waist to wash woolens washing clean hot soap suds rinse out in clear hot water and shake out the wet without passing through the wringer worsted dress goods should never be wrung when washed to wash white lace edging have a quart bottle covered with linen stitch smoothly to fit the shape begin at the bottom and wind the lace about it basting fast at both edges even the minutest point to the linen wash on the bottle soaping it well rinse by plunging in a pail of fair water and boil as you would a white handkerchief bottle and all set in the hot sun to dry when quite dry clip the basting threads and use the lace without ironing if neatly basted on it will look nearly as well as new if not quite black lace one half cup rain water or very soft spring water one teaspoonful borax one tablespoonful spirits of wine squeeze the tumbled rusty lace through this four times then rinse in a cup of hot water in which a black kid glove has been boiled pull out the edges of the lace until almost dry then press for two days between the leaves of a heavy book to sponge black worsted dresses sponge on the right side with a strong tea made of fig leaves and iron on the wrong this process restores luster and crispness to alpaca bombazine etc to clean very dirty black dresses two parts soft water to one part alcohol or if there be paint spots upon the stuff spirits turpentine soap a sponge well dip in the mixture and rub a breadth at a time on both sides stretching it upon a table iron on the wrong side or that which is to be inside when the stuff is made up sponge off with fair water hot but not scalding before you iron iron while damp to remove stains from marble make a mortar of unslacked lime and very strong lye cover the spot thickly with it and leave it on for six weeks wash it off perfectly clean and rub hard with a brush dipped in a lather of soap and water polished with a smooth hard brush iron mold is as nearly eradicable as it is possible for stain to be try moistening the part injured with ink and while this is wet 
rub in muriatic acid diluted with five times its weight of water i have heard that the old and new stain can sometimes be removed together by this operation mildew is likewise obstinate if anything will extract it it is lemon juice mixed with an equal weight of salt powdered starch and soft soap rub on thickly and lay upon the grass in the hot sun renewing the application two or three times a day until the spot fades or comes out i have also used salt wet with tomato juice often renewed laying the article stained upon the grass sometimes the stain was taken out sometimes not ink while the stains are yet wet upon the carpet sponge them with skim milk thoroughly then wash out the milk with a clean sponge dipped again and again in fair water cold exchange this presently for warm then rub dry with a cloth if the stain is upon any article of clothing or table or bed linen wash in the milk well afterward in the water dry ink stains can be removed from white cloth by oxalic acid or lemon juice and salt stains of acids and alkalis treat acid stains with hartshorn alkaline with acids for instance if the color be taken out of cloth by whitewash wash with strong vinegar grease spots one quart boiling water one ounce pulverized borax one half ounce of gum camphor shake up well and bottle it is excellent for removing grease spots from woolens cure for burns one-third part linseed oil two-thirds lime water shake up well apply and wrap in soft linen until you can procure this keep the part covered with wood soot mix to a soft paste with lard or if you have not these with common molasses to stop the flow of blood bind the cut with cobwebs and brown sugar pressed on like lint or if you cannot procure these with the fine dust of tea when the blood ceases to flow apply laudanum to relieve asthma soak blotting or tissue paper in strong saltpeter water dry and burn at night in your bedroom i know this to be an excellent prescription antidotes to poison for any poison swallow instantly a glass of cold water with a heaping teaspoonful of common salt and one of ground mustard stirred in this is a speedy emetic when it has acted swallow the whites of two raw eggs if you have taken corrosive sublimate take half a dozen raw eggs besides the emetic if laudanum a cup of very strong coffee if arsenic first the emetic then half a cup of sweet oil or melted lard cologne water fine number one one dram oil lavender one dram oil bergamot two dram oil lemon two dram oil rosemary fifty drops tincture of musk eight drops oil of cinnamon eight drops oil of cloves one pint of alcohol cologne water number two sixty drops oil of lavender sixty drops oil of bergamot sixty drops oil of lemon sixty drops orange flower water one pint of alcohol cork and shake well hard soap six pounds washing soda three pounds unslaked lime pour on four gallons boiling water let it stand until perfectly clear then drain off put in six pounds clean fat boil until it begins to harden about two hours stirring most of the time while boiling thin with two gallons of cold water which you have poured on the alkaline mixture after draining off the four gallons this must also settle clear before it is drawn off add it when there is danger of boiling over try the thickness by cooling a little on a plate put in a handful of salt just before taking from the fire wet a tub to prevent sticking turn in the soap and let it stand until solid cut into bars put on a board and let it dry this will make about forty pounds of nice soap much better for washing when it has dried out for two or three months then yellow turpentine soap bar soap buy a box at a time cut into small squares and lay upon the garret floor to dry for several weeks before it is used soft soap ten pounds grease six pounds soda washing eight gallons hot water let it stand for several days until the grease is eaten up 
if too thick add more water stir every day if wood ashes are used instead of soda boil the mixture end of section fifty five end of common sense in the household a manual of practical housewifery by marion harland